So we're going to be jumping forward a little bit here because my demo disk access is going to be kind of scattershot for a little while until I can source the um, proper disks in right order. Oh. Then we caught up with pro skateboarder Tony Hawk to check out his new traveling BMX skateboard and motocross exhibition, the Boom Boom Hawk Jam. After that, it was off to E3 to try some of the games so you can play with the new network adapter for the PlayStation 2. It's pretty sweet. Plus, there's game demos, downloads, All right, so, so dive on it was a pretty big step up with the PlayStation 2 with the DVDs in these demo discs. One of the big things that they did was they had a lot more of these sort of intro video sequences. It seems like by this point they've gotten rid of Maggie as a character. It was a little bit weird, I guess, but I can't read that text at all. This is definitely made for a CRT. But the increase in video quality allowed these kinds of things to be in much more abundance and higher quality on this. Because it's like, um, like an MPEG-2 videos in DVD quality compared to like the motion JPEGs, which poor compression and all that, that was used in the PlayStation 1. So everything looks so much better on the PS2. But compared to nowadays, where we have um, HD video and all that, DVDs aren't HD, so it just looks dated by nowadays comparison, but it looks so good back then. Let's jump right to the vault. I wanna see the vault. All the games are, oh, Spyro, enter the dragonfly, <laughs> enter the dragonfly. Spyro is one of those interesting um, series. It was a mid PlayStation 1 generation series that came about, I think. It wasn't early, that's for sure, and it wasn't that late. There was a couple of Spyro games on the PS1 before that console went obsolete. But it was one of the better looking ones. And I thought it played alright, although I was never a huge fan. It um, it was created by Insomniac, which is now a... Did the game crash? <laughs> oh, god damn, the game crashed. Damn it. It's not going to load. Alright, I can't get Spyro to load. What I was going to say was that... Spyro was a game created by Insomniac, which is now, although it wasn't at the time, a Sony first-party party studio. You could think of it really as a Sony second-party studio. Sony didn't own it, but they seemed to have produced everything exclusively for Sony. Fortunately for them, though, Spyro, because it was published by another company, I think maybe Universal or someone like that, Insomniac didn't get to keep the rights to Spyro. So they did make a few Spyro games, but Universal or whoever it was went and started making games in the Spyro universe from other publishers and ended up making all the money. And Spyro was actually the genesis of the Skylanders games, which, although it's a dead thing now, for a few years though, Skylanders was enormous. The Toys to Life, I think people call it now. Uh, it was sort of the birth of that, and it was a billion-dollar franchise there. All birthed from Spyro, but Insomniac never saw that money. <laughs> so, uh, let's uh, move on. <laughs> Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2. Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 1 was a, was a, in its day anyway, a big deal on the PlayStation 1 because it, people loved the idea of, of the high-speed cop chases. And I think that's a thing that was realized more um, fully by Driver and Grand Theft Auto. Driver especially on the PlayStation 1. Oh, look at this weird color banding. I'm not sure Hot Pursuit 2 anybody ever really gave a shit about it once it uh once it oh my god the color banding is terrible is that an emulation problem or is this what the game looked like it's got to be an emulation issue i mean the whole cops chasing you thing is an interesting um little 
gameplay element that they put in here, I am terrible at this. But the fact that it's not an open world kind of distracts from it a little bit. I mean, you're just on a track. And there are cops here, but Driver ended up being a much better... Oh, shit! <laughs> Driver ended up being a much better realization of this concept. And of course, Grand Theft Auto, once we hit Grand Theft Auto 3 anyway, really ran with that ball. <laughs> That's why uh, I'm not sure anybody... I, I know the Hot Pursuit games continued for a while. But it wasn't as well uh, regarded in the PlayStation 2 as that original Hot Pursuit game was. Of course, I'm not a huge racing game fan. So I'll play them now and again, and I like the more arcade racers than I do the... Oh, jeez. Definitely, definitely a lot of emulation glitches. Oh, they got me. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe they didn't get me. Oh, they did get me. <laughs> Busted. And the, and the game's glitching. Alright, let's back out. Downforce. Another racing game, huh? <laughs> the emulator is glitching. The, uh, the rumble feature on my controller is just constantly going right now. That is gonna wear my batteries out. How do I... Free race. Why not just put that as the default? <laughs> Alright, so we got Formula One here. Not as, um... Not as popular a thing in the United States. In the U.S., racing, the big racing franchise in the United States is NASCAR, and that's that's not my thing. I don't honestly, I don't see much entertainment in NASCAR at all. I think this holy shit <laughs> killed him. This kind of thing is definitely uh, more entertaining because there are more turns. <laughs> you know, just what turning left over and over again, turning right too occasionally. Hmm. Uh, they gotta hit the brake every once in a while. This is definitely not as arcadey of a racer as I would like. I do like the arcadey style racers more, and which mean by that I mean the less realistic ones, burnout stuff like that. Although this doesn't feel particularly realistic, the way the car is um, handling feels weird. Although I've never driven a car like this before. Acceleration is crazy fast. Did I actually accelerate that fast? Racing I've been to, like I've been to um, quarter mile um, drag strip racing, and that's that's really something. I mean, it's it's only something I can tolerate in short bursts, because <laughs> I mean, there's only so many times I can watch two cars pull up to a line accelerate really fast and then stop really quick because the race is only a freaking quarter mile long. It's only so many times I can watch that happen. Before, like it's, it's something I'll go and watch every few years maybe and I'll be there for one evening and then it's, that's the end of it. <laughs> I think it's more in my case um, more of a appreciation of the technical side of it. The engineering and the maintenance and all that kind of stuff that goes into the vehicles rather than actually watching the race or giving a crap who wins or anything and this when you have racing organizations like this people tend to be like fans of specific drivers and it's not like it's not like if you're a basketball fan you'll have your favorite player you can see the player, you can see their face, you can do see all that. When you're racing, you're like, you mostly just see their car. And if they get out, you see, like, a helmet. 
It feels weird. I don't know. I'm just going on and on about how I'm not a huge fan of racing. Oh, I'm only on lap two? <laughs> I better figure out how to play this. Where's the brake? Alright, so square is the brake. <laughs> Alright, yeah, I'm getting the hang of it. I mean, I'm way ass behind now. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've crashed multiple times. <laughs> Yeah, I probably would have won if I'd done this from the beginning. Ah! What is... Why are they shouting over the radio? The game honestly doesn't look that great. I mean, um, Gran Turismo... Of course, uh, Gran Turismo, typically in the PlayStation anyway, in every generation it is in, tends to be among the best looking games for the PlayStation. Whatever PlayStation we're talking about. But like comparing this to like Gran Turismo 3, this game just does not look that great. Oh, it's over. Didn't even get all three uh, laps in. I mean, it's not that it looks terrible. I mean, the graphics are clean and all that, but they don't have a lot of detail to them. So. Anyway. Summoner 2. Summoner was one, the first Summoner anyway was one of the games that was on my list of um, first PlayStation 2 games. And by that I mean one of the games I was planning on, I was thinking about getting as my first PlayStation 2 game. I ended up getting the game Evergrace, and that was a bit of a disappointment. A um, FromSoft game. This... I wanted an RPG because I wanted a game... I, was, I knew it was going to be a while before I can get another game, and I wanted something to be able to that would take a long time to play through. And uh, so there was Summoner, there was Summoner, there was Evergrace, and there was Eternal Ring, I think were the three RPGs that were early PlayStation 2 games. I don't think any of the three were that good. I never ended up getting the Summoner, though. You know, actually, you know what? I did get the summoner, but the summoner I got was like a PC release of it, released on GOG like two years ago or something, and I still haven't played it. Oh my god, is this the way the game played? I do not remember this demo at all. I do not remember this at all. You know, I always kind of assumed that the Summoner was a turn-based game. I guess it isn't. At least the second one, isn't it? Getting attacked by pirates. What I was really hoping out of RPGs for the PlayStation 2 was something that we didn't end up getting for a while. And that was sort of like a more open-worldy kind of thing that, like, yeah. I was kind of hoping for something like Morrowind, which the PlayStation 2, I, you know, I can't really think of a good example of. Not Morrowind in the sense of, like, a Western-style RPG or an Elder Scrolls game, but one where the world was large and you have this enormous scope in the sense of the world. And maybe the Summoner gave that, but Evergrace certainly didn't. The Evergrace uh, was just a series of levels and you advance from one to the next. And the world didn't feel large. Same thing with Eternal Ring. Um, I'd say Final Fantasy XII did. 
but it wasn't a contiguous world. I actually do like Final Fantasy XII's way that they set up their world, but it wasn't quite what I was expecting, where it was a bunch of different like map segments that were interconnected to each other. But I was expect I was hoping that you would see a lot more of the Elder Scroll style large contiguous map, which I guess you really didn't even get in the Elder Scrolls games until you know what, never mind. <laughs> I'm talking nonsense. Of course, it's a design principle that maybe wouldn't have worked that well on the PlayStation 2 because... Oh, is this guy an ally? Oh, no, he's not. <laughs> because it doesn't have a lot of memory and you gotta read off the, the disc. And I guess, like, Grand Theft Auto was sort of a sort of a realization of that, although that's not an RPG in any way. But I wanted to have something that sort of felt like what Ocarina of Time was, if Ocarina of Time had all of the various um, pieces of its map just connected into one contiguous environment. This is not fun. <laughs> so, oh, loading screen right away. Oh, fish man. <laughs> Okay. What? <laughs> oh, fish girls on her side. Party received flaming cutlass. You see, uh, the Xbox, in a certain style of RPG anyway, really had the advantage. I mean, there was Morrowind on the Xbox, and there was Knights of the Old Republic, which was on the Xbox. And those are two very different types of games than what I was expecting. And of course, they don't have contiguous worlds that you uh, play, but how do I... Equip that sword. Can't dual wield. Fire's passing right through you, girl. But uh, with any new generation, you don't really know what you're going to get. Nobody really has the kind of vision to know exactly what the future of games will be. And of course, I didn't have... The technical understanding to, to realize that the PS2 wasn't really built to handle that kind of environment. Of course, I mean, no console was. It's all going to depend on the uh, what the developers can do with it. Of course, this one's fire, isn't it? I can't do any damage to it because I'm using the wrong fucking weapon. Gotta kill this one. <laughs> and my fish queen is not is about to die. <laughs> How do I summon things? <laughs> I'm about to die. I'm only mashing the square button. There's got to be a different attack, huh? Yep, she's about the 18 health, 9 health, 0 health. She's dead. Nobody really knows exactly what... Let's get out of this exactly what the new generation is going to bring, especially in the beginning. So... Hey, the marker cry. Korkirai. I, I don't fucking know how to pronounce it. So I don't really blame myself too much for not foreseeing what the future would bring. San Diego Studios. Ah, oh, man. It's amazing to think about how people tend not to People look at Nintendo, 
and you have Smash Brothers, which is sort of, in a sense, a celebration of all the decades of what Nintendo has brought to the video game world with all of these different characters. And you'll have fairly obscure characters from the past brought out, like, um, like I don't know, um, the dude with the wings. I don't, I don't freaking know his name. Oh, I'm, I'm playing. <laughs> and you... And people say, like, well, Nintendo can do that because Nintendo has decades of these various characters that people remember and people love and all that kind of stuff that they can load into this fighting game. And it just sort of... Honestly, I never thought any of the Smash Brothers games were all that good gameplay-wise. I think more it's just a nostalgia trip that people are always going down when they play those things. Don't know offense if you enjoy Smash Brothers, they just happen to be wrong. <laughs> I know I'm an asshole. Sony, people say that Sony with uh, All Stars Battle Royal, I think was the game. That came out like 10 years ago, though. Or 8, 9 years ago, whatever. I, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Because Nintendo had been around for so long by the time, as a game company, it had been around for freaking ever as a company in general, but it had been so, um, it had been around for so long as a video game company that they had so many different characters that they could draw upon in their history to be able to create something like that, like Smash Brothers. But Sony has actually had... I mean, I don't know if people really think like, Oh, Mark of Cry. Or Mark of Cry. That's some awesome game that I remember from my childhood. Maybe somebody does. I don't know. Certainly not me. But Sony does have a lot of characters over the years that they've... What is this? There's a lot of characters that they've created over the years that... Either, if even if not identifiable as a PlayStation game, I'm sorry. Even if not um, a Sony-owned property, certainly identified, very much identified as a Sony series, like Spyro. Spyro, Sony never owned that. Sony never published it. Nothing. At least I don't think so. <laughs> but it's definitely something that people think of as Sony. Crash Bandicoot, something that thought of as definitely a Sony thing, even if Sony never owned it. But you have lots of stuff, like this was a Sony first-party game. You have this, you have, of course, the more popular ones like Kratos. You have all sorts of, um, that dude from, uh, from Medieval. The guy from Infamous, all these different characters now that Sony has had building up for a decade, for the multiple decades now that this has been a gaming company. It feels like even though All Stars Battle Royal was a little bit of a flop in terms of um, it's sort of like Smash Brothers like impact that they had, Smash Brothers like impact that they were going for. I think if they did it nowadays, it would be received much better. Because when did they do that? I'm going to say Sony did that in like 2011 or so. 2012? Let's say it's 2012 that Sony did um, All-Stars Battle Royal. So in 2012, Sony started, not, not really, but you could think of Sony starting as a game company in 1994. So that's like, what, what was the year did I say? Let's say it's, it's 18 years. So that's quite a while, and they had a number of characters they could populate that game with. But it's been another 10 years since then. And if you start pulling out like characters like this, that somebody out there must have some nostalgic feelings for. Or the guy from Medieval, or, or Klonoa, or all of these different things that they could draw upon, it would get received much better. And I think um, the PlayStation 5 pack-in title, um, 
the hell is that called? Astrobot? Or something like that? Even though it's not a fighting game, so it doesn't really match up with Smash Brothers one to one in a in a sense like that, I feel like that Astrobot game was sort of Sony's version of that, that sort of celebration of Sony's history in the gaming world, all of the characters and references, tie-ins and all that to tie-ins to everything Sony has done in the decades that they've been in, in the gaming world. So, even though you have characters, like, I don't think, maybe Marker Cry might have been a game that was referenced in that. I think maybe I remember seeing it, but you get up there? I guess that's a yes. <laughs> That long-winded point that I've been trying to make is I think Sony has, has reached a point now that they've been around long enough that they can be thought of in the same way that Nintendo was in the late 90s, I guess, when Smash Brothers... Maybe it was the early 2000s, I don't know. When Smash Brothers first became a thing. Just, I gotta be careful about it because it's not... Nintendo tends to be really prolific with a lot of their series, like Metroid and all that, but they do have a lot of things like Kid Icarus, that was the name of the dude with the wings. <laughs> Where, I don't know if too many people are really huge Kid Icarus fans, it's just that it's something that like some people remember, so they kind of get the warm and fuzzies for something that they may not have actually enjoyed too much. And plus, I think maybe... Oh, the bird. I forgot you could do shit with the bird. <laughs> Alright, uh, whatever. Uh, that's okay, there's stuff over here. Um, another point I was trying to make. Nintendo tends to cater more towards children in the market whereas oh shit i'm stuck oh but he went down okay we're good <laughs> nintendo tan uh, tends to skew younger in the market so they they shoot for the kids the kid market whereas sony has i think i think it was mentioned before that in the in the era of the playstation one sony was mar uh, was marketing something from like the 13 to 18 market or something like that I think I remember reading I mean who knows what the truth is to that but exactly how true that was but Sony was definitely trying to skew for an older market then you get into the PlayStation 2 and I think their market moved up a few years and then when you get to the PlayStation 3, I think I'd read something like 18 to 35 or something like that was the market that they were shooting for. But the Nintendo always, even though they've done some things like secure Capcom for the Resident Evil games to go for the older market, they've pretty much always found their bread and butter in the younger generation. So that creates a bit of a skewed perspective in a lot of people. So you have multiple generations all coming up, whether you are 20 right now or you're 40 right now. It's a good possibility that your first game console and the games that you played as a child were Nintendo games. So some Mario games, some Legend of Zelda games, some Smash Brothers games, some, uh, I don't know, Wii Fit, whatever the fuck. It's a good possibility that those were the games that you were raised on. So those are the games that you get the warm and fuzzies about when you think about gaming as a child. Whereas, I don't think nearly as many people identify with the Sony franchise when it comes to that nostalgia thing. Because there's a lot of... A lot of games on... Uh, there's a lot of Nintendo games, especially, that I go back and I play for, like, the NES. 
and like I think wow I remember having so much fun with this so much fun with this when I was a kid like the original Legend of Zelda then I'm playing it now it's like you know what this I don't honestly think the original Legend of Zelda is a fun game anymore I think the, the layout of the world is goofy I'm getting my ass kicked <laughs> Die, dude, in a dress. <laughs> but, you know, it'll always have that sort of... I will always remember The Legend of Zelda as being a great game. Even if I can't really stand playing it anymore. And I don't think... Well, since I didn't get a place to... Well, obviously, I'm of a certain age where Sony wasn't even in the market until I was... God, I don't feel like doing the math. It's going to make me depressed. <laughs> but I was I was older when um, Sony entered the market. With a console, anyway. So, it's... There was no PlayStation first or second party game that I played when I was five. So, it's, it's different. Like, Super Mario Bros. 1. Like, people like, oh, it was a revolutionary game, and it was. The first Super Mario Bros. game, and I mean the side-scrolling thing, not the arcade game. The side-scrolling game for the NES. Was a pretty revolutionary game in terms of, like, how well it played, and... There were, there were side-scrolling games before then, of course. But it was a pretty big deal in its time. I can't play it anymore. It is... Like, it controls very poorly. Mario 3, on the other hand, much better game. But even still, I go back and I play it, and it feels like, oh, wow, this is this is a game that I remember I, I loved as a kid. You know what? By default, I think it's a great game. Unfortunately, it's not something I can stand playing for that long, because I think, even though um, like Super Mario World for the SNES, even though people tend not to like it as much, a couple of years newer in terms of design and technology and all that kind of stuff. I feel like it just plays better. Wow, I'm way off topic here. I'm not even talking about the damn game I'm playing. This game here, it's big deal. Like there was a lot of experimentation going on in the play, especially the early PlayStation 2 era, because 3D games were becoming more prolific. I mean, you saw them coming about, of course, in the PlayStation 1 and the Saturn and the N64. But that was definitely like the freshman effort. And a lot of games like Tomb Raider or whatever controlled very poorly. So you see more power in this console and you see more experimentation on how to control a 3D character. Now the big deal about this one was this kind of uh, thing where you can target multiple enemies simultaneously. And that allows you to it, and it maps the face buttons to different uh, to different enemies, so you can jump around and target each one individually. And that was its, that was its big gimmick there. Clearly, it wasn't like the world changing thing that the developers thought it would be, considering that I haven't seen this in any game since. But it was definitely like a an experiment. Oh, there's a ladder over here. It was definitely an experiment, and I think, I guess it works pretty good, but, you know, they took the kind of lock-on thing that you saw in, like, Ocarina of Time, and expanded it to being able to target multiple enemies, so, like, Square and Cross are linked to these two different enemies that I've locked on to. So I'm locked on to multiple enemies, and switching between the face buttons, I can... I can just attack this one, or I can press cross and move on to that one. So the, how, how they avoid the whole, like, Bruce Lee fight, fight scene style thing, where you're surrounded by enemies and only one of them ever seems to attack you at once. You see it a lot in, um, like, Assassin's Creed and stuff like that also. Or in o Ocarina of Time, we tend not to have that many enemies on screen at once. So it wasn't big a huge deal for them 
but they want to have like chaotic scenes and they try to make it easier for you to play through it by by um, having you be able to attack back and forth between multiple enemies simultaneously. It's a cool idea. But, and the, I guess the game feels a little less floaty because of it. Because you can lock on instead of just attacking like in medieval style game. Can't get through there. Alright, so I've been playing this one for a little while. If I can't figure out how to get through here, I'm just going to give up on this game. Climb up there, bro. What are you doing? Oh, you can't walk through knee-deep water, huh? Oh, alright. What just happened? <laughs> Is this concept art? What am I looking at here? Oh, okay, it's over. <laughs> Draken or Draken or whatever the hell. This is another game that I had wanted to get as a... Um, wanted to get as a... It, it was one of those games that had a lot of hype to it early in the PlayStation 2 heading coming out with, but it just didn't... Um, I don't know. It was a it was a PC game originally. It was the first Draken was a PC game, and then the PlayStation Two comes out, and it's like this. The, the sequel is a PlayStation Two game, so I wonder how much real crossover there was in terms of market there, because PC gamers tended not to buy consoles. I mean, I guess there was some crossover, but like, how many of the how many of the people who bought the first game were going to be able to even buy the second game or how many people that bought the second game even had the option of buying the first game because especially at the time gaming pcs are never really cheap but they tend to be they are cheaper nowadays but they're always more expensive than consoles how do i do i can i lock on ah screw it oh i'm getting attacked I'm playing Lair. But this is an RPG, right? I did I ended up um, fairly recently spending a little bit of time with this game. But it's that but it's not something that I ended up getting. By the time I got to the point where I could uh, can I get off of this thing? I'm supposed to be able to get off of the dragon, I think. I kind of want to run around a bit. It's another one of those game series that sort of died off at a certain point. Where, um... Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, she doesn't have her sword. There it is. <laughs> it's, it's an axe. Oh! Uh, what's the dragon's name? Ranker? R R Draenor? I don't fucking know. It's, uh, it's helping me out. <laughs> it's another one of those, um, game series that's had a lot of promise, had a sequel, all that. Just sort of died off. And I remember looking at this. This is one of those games that was hyped in the early PlayStation 2 uh, the lead up to the PlayStation 2 especially, I remember there was a Next Generation article that referenced this as being one of like the breakout PlayStation 2 games before its release. How it took the gameplay of the first one, but like made it better and took the visuals of the first one and made it better. But looking at it now, I mean it does control kind of clunky, look, early PlayStation 2. Like I was saying a minute ago, there's a lot of experimentation because... They hadn't really figured out 3D controls yet. Plus, the world is pretty sparse in terms of design. There's not a lot going on here. It, things at a distance actually look pretty good. Um, she died. At a distance... Let's get back into it real quick, then I'll, I'll point out.
point out what I'm talking about. This world actually looks pretty good at a distance. And when we're looking at the mountains off a ways, it looks pretty cool. But as I'm running around on the map, the environment looks pretty bland. But it was a pretty big deal they were talking about how the game allowed you to, without loading screens or anything, pretty seamlessly... It's sort of got a semi-modern control scheme with the right analog stick um, controlling like the left and right motions and motion, forward motion and all that kind of stuff controlled with the left stick. Not too bad. But I mean, looking at this from up here, the game looks pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good for a fairly early PlayStation 1 game, PlayStation 2 game, I'm sorry. Just when you get down to the to the ground and the grass texture is low res. <laughs> and it's repeating over and over again. What just happened? Oh, the dragon died. <laughs> Alright. Get out of this. Robot? Alchemic Drive? What the hell is this? Don't remember this one at all. PlayStation 2 was another one of those consoles. Enix, huh? The PS2, just like the PS1, was one of those consoles where there was an enormous... movie, huh? An enormous difference between the early games in the generation and the late games in the generation. So, I remember there was... A, oh, shit. It was just going to play a, a trailer. Let's get back in. The early games in the generation, I remember being seen as something of a disappointment in terms of what they looked like. I mean, they were better than PlayStation 1 games, and most of them, anyway, looked better than Dreamcast games, but not as good as you would have expected. They're all 17. They don't look 17. This one especially. Look at them. I guess it's not wrinkles. It's hair. Is there a difference between um, these? No, they have the same robots. Alright, this one's balanced. Whatever. And it was, it was a... It, there was a learning experience with the developers having to get used to the consoles. How they had to... The intricacies of the way the development would have to be with them. So you sort of have like those first generation games, either launch games or games that came out within the first year. Oh, this is English. Wasn't expecting that. It's a fairly clean, this is a fairly clean looking game, but it does feel like a little, oh, I can fly, look at this shit. Oh, is he gonna fall? Oh no, no, he's fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just let me, get me in the robot and have me blow some shit up. Controls like shit though. And the environment does kind of look kind of ugly. Like, look at the texture wrapping around the corner there. And not a lot of detail and repeating textures and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks for joining me for shopping. Let's catch the next train. Oh, God. Voice acting is so terrible. Anyway, the developers had to learn the intricacies of the PlayStation 2, and there are a lot of weird... Oh, some shit's going down. A lot of complications compared to PlayStation 1 development for the PS2. And 
developers took a little while getting used to it. So you had the first generation games. I'm going to say that's launch games, the games that came out in the first year. Year and a half, I don't know. And then you had the sort of second generation game where either it's a second game being developed for the console or ones that had the benefit of better dev tools or um, industry-wide experience of the console disseminating out and people have being able to learn from what happened beforehand. Then you have like the late gen PlayStation 2 games where like if you look at a lot of the stuff in the when it came out like it like Drake in there and then compare that to well now that's not a very good comparison because that's a large environment. I guess Drake in kind of matches the concept that I was talking about before what I was really looking forward into in an RPG with a large environment. Am I supposed to like get over here and punch this thing? Oh, that's a big no. <laughs> Man, look at all that blood that went. How did you get down here? <laughs> you, look, you look oddly calm. In the city. <laughs> Voice acting has always been a problem in games. <laughs> it's better now than it's ever been, but sometimes it feels really cheesy and bad. God, let me play the fucking game. <laughs> Get to Neo's home? Where is that? The Red Spots are home. Oh, this is a pretty big environment here. Oh, look at this ground texture. I'm getting close. I guess she'll follow me regardless of whether I'm hopping over buildings. It's gotta be our house over here, right? Um, I'm there, right? <laughs> or this one? You think there'd be like an objective marker or like a nav point that you could walk into? And I guess she didn't follow me? <laughs> oh, okay. Everyone's dead. Except for those people running through the rubble. Oh, did I do it? <laughs> what am I supposed to do now? Dude can go real high. Jeez. All right, I'm I'm moving on. <laughs> Treasure planet. Oh, it's a video. Treasure Planet's um, a book, and I guess there was oh, the Treasure Island. Fuck, I don't know what Treasure Planet is. <laughs> I guess a Disney movie, and then they made a game out of it. I don't know. I I had stopped really watching the Disney movies years before this, so I don't know what I'm looking at here. <laughs> Certainly wasn't playing the games. It used to be a big thing, I remember as a kid, a, kind of a big event when Disney would make a 
make a new animated movie. Because you would have... I guess it felt like there was one a year or one every two years or so. So you'd get like uh, The Little Mermaid or then you'd get Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and all that kind of stuff. And every one of these would come out, it would be a big deal. But I guess Disney sort of saturated the market a bit. Plus, I was older, so I wouldn't give a shit about this kind of thing. But it feels like they watered it down by having so many movies coming out. Like, what the hell was that one? That David Spade one. Like, Emperor's New Groove. Like, why is that a thing? Why is that a thing? Kelly Slater's Pro Surfer. Another video. Another kind of um, diving into influenced by... Never played this, I don't think. But influenced by the Tony Hawk craze. And it honestly, I mean, I haven't played it, but it kind of looks like it might have a somewhat similar gameplay style. This is definitely something that you could not have seen on the PlayStation 1 because the environment has just got so much geometry transformations and all that kind of stuff going on. Whereas the PlayStation 1 really... It it's had a math, sort of a math coprocessor in it to help with geometry uh, transformations and all that kind of stuff, calculations and all that. But it... It didn't use... Uh, floating point math and its performance wasn't really high enough to do stuff like this. That's why you see like Jet Moto ended up looking a lot worse in terms of water animations and stuff compared to like Wave Race 64. Because the N64 did have um, more forward thinking hardware in terms of geometry calculations and stuff. The PlayStation 2, they really put a lot of effort when designing the console and the giving abilities like that. Had um, a pair of vector coprocessors integrated into the CPU, which really helped for um, polygonal meshes and transformations and all that kind of stuff. It seemed to have almost been tailor-made to give you the ability to do things like this game. Of course, it's not... I mean, of course, modern consoles and PCs and all that kind of stuff are certainly capable of that kind of thing, but they do it in a much more straightforward way, I think. It's part of the complexities of the PS2, having those coprocessors in there. Oh, I never played this, but that Superman game for the N64 just, like I have Vietnam flashbacks over that kind of shit. This game, I've ne I don't think I've ever played this. I've never been a fan of Superman as a character. I think when you create a character that is so ridiculously overpowered that you have to invent reasons why he can't just always win, you've created a bad character. And that's how I see Superman. Like, oh, well, um... Superman is basically a god, so... Like, oh, well, you have, um... I remember there was a friend of mine who was talking about a Superman movie that was coming out. And he had said something like... Like, oh, it's gonna be a great movie, all this and that, and like... like and I asked him something like, well, how does... How does somebody beat Superman? How is somebody supposed to be a threat to Superman? When he's so powerful. And he responds with... Well, you just get a whole lot of kryptonite. I'm like, oh yeah, that's original. Isn't that going to just be the um, the plot like every damn Superman story? <laughs> Kingdom Hearts. Oh my god, the first Kingdom Hearts. There have been a lot of like sub-sequels to this, haven't there? Honestly, I never played Kingdom Hearts. Or if I did, I didn't play it for very long. Surprise is the only certainty. It was supposed to be like a... Um, it sort of drifted away from this in more recent years. But it was supposed to be a sort of weird cross between Disney characters, Disney uh, 
movie characters and the Final Fantasy characters. So you would have Donald Duck here. Daffy Duck. Fuck, I don't know. Which one's which? <laughs> and Goofy and all that. But then you'll have, like, Cloud and Squall and, and such in the same game. And, like, it's a weird, weird mismatch. Mishmatch. I think... I mean, I haven't played them. I haven't played these games. But I think the more recent ones have drifted away from the Final Fantasy aspect and focused a lot more on the Disney aspect. So it became more of like this RPG with this character here with this Keyblade and Disney characters being everywhere. Or jumping to different like Disney worlds, like Toy Story World or whatever. As opposed to being something where you have the and I might be talking at my ass because I didn't, I didn't play them. This is what I hear from other people who do play them. That sort of drifted off of its initial premise. I hear they're good games. I just never dove into it. I kind of, um, at this point, I kind of felt like. Eh, the RPG stories I wanted to play needed to have a little bit more of a serious tone than what I was seeing out of these trailers and hearing about the game. Not to say that everything needs to take itself too seriously, it just it this didn't appeal to me. Plus I didn't have I didn't have the um, this, uh, the connection to the Disney the Disney things, because I grown out of Disney at this point, and I didn't really give a crap about the Disney characters or the Disney stories. I hear it's good, though, so, I don't know. Maybe I'll check it out someday. There's so many things, though, that I could always check out some... Oh, see, there's Cloud. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Or that. <laughs> I'm guessing these are characters from Disney movies. But I'm not... <laughs> a lot of the, the references they're making here, or the, I guess, cameos the characters have, are just lost on me. Jeez, the trailer just keeps starting over again. <laughs> We're starting up again. Oh, so there's Aladdin. I guess Aladdin was the last of the Disney movies that I actually, like, had gotten into, really. What year was that? I guess I was kind of on the young side to move away from Disney, but whatever. Let me ask the robot. Alexa, when did the movie Aladdin release? Nineteen ninety-two. Shit, I was young. Wow. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, is that... Uh, oh, okay. We're looking at um, Nightmare Before Christmas. You know, I do like the look of the character models here. I wonder if these are in-game. Or... Well, in battle, they look pretty good. You know, I do like the... There's a lot of different contrasting art styles that they have. I guess moving to the different movie worlds. The art styles do look pretty cool as it transitions around. And they... Like I was saying before about how PlayStation 2 games, like the later gen you got, the better they looked. And this is definitely an example. Definitely doesn't look like a first gen 
a PlayStation 2 game. From the creators of Final Fantasy comes an epic adventure. Follow the journey through multiple Disney worlds. Meet new and familiar Disney characters. Expect the unexpected. You will never know who you will run into next. Um. Yes, Fall O2. Okay, we're there. Wow, we're an hour into this video. I'm going to have to split this one up. <laughs> so, we'll do demos and then everything else will be um everything else will be the extra content.